so hi thank you so much for joining and my name is Priya and I'm one of the new trustees at NF2 Biosolutions UK and um, I'm a part of NF2 Biosolutions because I'm a patient myself and I'm also a junior doctor based in Oxford so I'm very excited to be introducing this very important topic today on the theme of Avastin treatment for NF2 alongside some important research updates. So before we begin, just a few housekeeping things. So if you do have any questions, just type them in the Q&A box below and we'll try to get around to as many questions as possible throughout and at the end of the webinar. Um, we do have captions available. So if you press the CC button at the bottom of your screen, they sh you should start to see some captions. Um, and now I'd like to introduce our panelists. So we're very honored to have Dr. Scott Plotkin and Professor Gareth Evans join us today. Dr. Plotkin is a neurosurgical oncologist based at Harvard Medical School, and he's internationally renowned for his work in neurofibromatosis and Avastin. And then we have Professor Gareth Evans, who is a clinical geneticist based at the University of Manchester and has been instrumental in driving forward the NF2 clinical service here in the UK. So um, also a quick disclaimer. So we are unable to provide individualized medical advice, and this is for educational purposes. However, hopefully it will be very useful for everyone today. And we also want to make some quick announcements from the charity. So I'm going to pass over to Gilles first to talk about the US arm. Yes. Hello. Hi, I'm Gilles Atlan, and I'm the dad of Karen. She has NF2. She's 16 years old, and I represent here NF2 Biosolution. Currently, we are fundraising for our NF2 Biobank. Um, as you might know, NF2 Biosolution just started a different type of research for NF2. And um, one thing that is common along all these different research is the need of um, biobank. So having access to tissue, to NF2 tissue and, uh, and uh, data about this tissue. So we will appreciate if you can uh, donate to any NF2 bio solution so we can continue to maintain this biobank and also collect more samples and that we can share after that with a different researcher. Thank you, Priya, you can continue. Okay. Thank you, Shields. And um, just a quick update from the UK side. So we're excited to announce that our project, which was looking at inflammation in vestibular schwannomas in NF2 at Manchester University is being extended and we continue to support this work in the future. Um, we've also had some great fundraising events. So we've had the wards who have just trekked the Viking Way trek in the Humber. We have Victor's uncle training hard for a triathlon and we also have Emily, a patient who has taken on 220,000 steps this month. We also have our COO, Joe Ward, who has an Avastin diary, um, which is basically following her son Oscar's journey on Avastin. And that is available on our website and it's extremely useful as well. And just to quickly highlight also our support groups. So we have the parent support group, which is dedicated for parents of NF2 patients from zero to 18 years old. And um, this QR code will take you to the sign up form. And we also have the young adults group, which is for those aged 18 to 35. Both of these are safe spaces to share your experiences and to learn from each other. So it's a good opportunity to scan the QR codes now. Um, and without further ado, I will stop sharing and we will have Dr. Plotkin presenting first. So over to you, Dr. Plotkin. Wonderful. Thank you. Thank you for the opportunity to present today. I, I got a field promotion to neurosurgeon. I'm not a neurosurgeon. I'm a, I'm a, a an on neuro-oncologist, medical oncologist. So um, I don't do surgery, just as a disclaimer. And anytime they ask me to present with Professor Evans, I take it. So, you know, that's an added draw. Who could pass up that opportunity, I'd like to say. So with that, let me share. And then you just help me make sure I'm on the right presentation mode, please. It's thinking, so give it a second. Is that the correct one, Priya, or the wrong one? Yeah, that's perfect. That's perfect. Okay, great. So I'm going to, uh, Dr. Professor Evans and I are going to share the presentation. I'll start off giving maybe an overview of Avastin and some of the U.S.-based experience, and then I'll hand it over to Professor Evans so he can take, take us home, so to speak, and then I think we'll be answering some questions. 
So first, some disclosures. Of course, I'm co-founder of a company called NF2 Therapeutics, where we're working on novel treatments for NF2-related schwannomatosis, so an important view to know, as well as an NF1 company and a Kuos, which is, an N which is a vestibular schwannoma company. And just, you know, it's helpful for people not to reproduce these slides too much because sometimes they get taken out of context. So if you could help me with that, I would appreciate it. So I'm going to introduce the topic today of bevacizumab by reminding us of something we already know, which is that vestibular schwannomas are a major source of decreased function or morbidity in people who have NF2-related schwannomatosis. And just a reminder that it's the bilaterality that really is the trouble here. Many people can live very successfully with one hearing ear, but when you lose hearing in both ears, particularly after the age of 12 or 13, it leads to late deafness, which is incredibly challenging as we know. And if you look at some of the natural history studies, the average time to hearing loss, sorry, um, and that hearing loss doesn't mean complete loss, but just a hearing decline is about 38 months, and the average time to tumor growth is about 14 months. Now, something we don't always remember is that tumor size is not well correlated with hearing loss. And so it doesn't always mean that the bigger the tumor, the more the hearing loss. And that's true also as we think about tumor shrinkage. So surgery and radiation have always been the standard of care for treatment of vestibular schwannomas. And that's because the vast majority of people who have vestibular schwannomas don't have NF2-related schwannomatosis. They have an isolated or sporadic vestibular schwannomas. But unfortunately, people who have NF2-related schwannomatosis do worse with surgery and radiation than people who have sporadic tumor tumors. And here's some of the data. If you look at hearing preservation, that happens in about 50% 50, 50 of ears for people who have NF2-related schwannomatosis. A much higher percent of the, uh, percentage of individuals retain hearing with surgery who have sporadic or isolated tumors. And you can see, when we think about recurrent tumors, to me, this is one of the most important parts of this whole talk, is early surgery, while it can retain hearing in a young person, because people are born with an abnormal copy of the NF2 gene, they're highly likely to develop other tumors on that vestibular nerve. So I do not personally believe that saving hearing, let's say at age six, is a permanent thing. It can be very helpful and should be considered. So I'm not trying to discourage early surgery for hearing preservation, but just to point out that many people will develop tumors in that ear even with outstanding surgery. And when it comes to radiation, we see a similar story. When we look at local control, that means lack of tumor growth after radiation, for people who have sporadic tumors, it's nearly 100%, meaning if you get radiation, if you're a candidate for radiation and you get current modern radiation, it's very unlikely your tumor is going to grow after radiation. The same cannot be said for people who have NF2-related schwannomatosis and probably for the same reason. Because people are born with a predisposition to develop tumors, they do develop additional tumors later on. You can see the numbers. These are older numbers, but I think still illustrative. Hearing preservation is even more challenging. You can see that, for example, after three years, 80% of people with sporadic vestibular schwannoma still have same hearing. That number is less than half for people who have NF2-related schwannomatosis. So it's not, I don't want to say that surgery and radiation are not valuable. They absolutely are in the right setting and for certain people. But what led us to study bevacizumab or Avastin is the fact that we knew that these in there by themselves were not sufficient. So here's how I think about in our specialty centers, how we manage vestibular schwannomas prior to the Avastin uh, era. Here's an individual who has these two very small vestibular schwannomas. We call that early stage. Maybe here's mid stage with these two vestibular schwannomas. And then here's somebody who has more advanced vestibular schwannomas that are compressing the brainstem. And here's our likelihood of recommending. Early on, we're much more likely to recommend observation. But by the time these tumors are getting big, we worry about brainstem compression. We worry about facial weakness, and so we're, 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 we're not sure that observation is the best way at that point. When I think about surgery, there's really two peaks. We think about surgery early, early for hearing preservation for some of the reasons I thought I mentioned previously. 
And we also are much more likely to recommend surgery when tumors are large and causing brainstem compression. And so you have this U-shaped curve where you're kind of unlikely to do it in the mid-stage vestibular schwannomas because people are likely to lose their hearing and have only modest benefit from surgery. So how did we arrive at bevacizumab? Well, it turns out that you a tumor is embedded in a microenvironment. So that's a very important concept in medicine. You have tumor cells, but they don't develop in a vacuum like they do in a laboratory when you grow a tumor cell in a Petri dish. In fact, these tumors arise within the context of a normal nerve. That normal nerve has normal nerve cells, normal Schwann cells, it has inflammation cells, it has blood vessels. And we know that the blood vessels in tumors are distinct and different than normal blood vessels. And you can see here in this cartoon, when there's a balance of pro-angiogenic, that means um, proteins that promote tumor growth, and anti-angiogenic, those are proteins that inhibit tumor growth, when those are well balanced as in a normal tissue, you get this beautiful architecture where an artery leads to an arteriole, which leads to a capillary bed. These are described the size of the blood vessel. And then after oxygenating the tissue, they collect into the vein system. Here's an example of what it looks like when we're out of whack. When a tumor cell produces too many pro-angiogenic um, compounds, and too few anti-angiogenic, you get this chaotic and incompetent set of blood vessels. And we now know that angiogenesis or abnormal angiogenesis is one of the hallmarks of cancer and one of the challenges of treating tumors. So we began more than a decade ago looking at vestibular schwannomas to see, do they express some of these abnormal, uh, blood, uh, abnormal proteins that stimulate tumor growth, that stimulate abnormal blood vessel growth? And the answer is yes. CD31 is a stain for blood vessels, and these are very large dilated blood vessels like that chaotic cartoon that I showed you. VEGF stands for vascular endothelial growth factor. This is the strongest and most potent angiogenic factor that we know. VEGF R2 is a vascular endothelial growth factor receptor 2. This is what the, this protein binds to. And what you see here is there's widespread VEGF production, a little bit of focal VEGF R2 production. These work together like a fist in a glove. And then there's another protein here called PDGFR beta, which is another receptor. And the take home message is when we quantified this, when we put numbers on it, we could show that compared to normal nerves, vestibular schwannomas had very abnormal blood vessels and thus were an appropriate target uh, for anti-angiogenic therapy. And so we looked to this drug called bevacizumab, also known as Avastin, which is a monoclonal antibody. What that means is it is generated in the lab, it's a protein generated in the laboratory by recombinant DNA technology. This has been the revolution in the biotech industry. And it is a highly specific antibody that blocks the function of this factor called VEGF. When we started this, it was approved for treatment in cancer and many other indications. It had been given and has been given to millions of patients worldwide. And the side effects or the toxicity in cancer patients include high blood pressure, something we call proteinuria, which means protein leakage into the urine, completely asymptomatic, but does indicate some dysfunction or, or um, abnormal function of the kidney, as well as blood clots and bleeding episodes. Now, one thing we know is that people with NF2 tend to be younger and healthier, medically speaking, than cancer patients. And so some of these side effects we were worried about, but in the end, turned out not to be as dangerous or not as many side effects as we've seen in our patients who have cancer. So here's some of our initial experience that really made us think this could work. I want to show you here a hearing test. This is word recognition score. 100% would mean that this individual could identify 100% of words on a word list. So when they say, you will say ball, they said ball back, and so forth. This is a, a time on the x-axis, starting at zero when this person received the first dose of Avastin, and then moving forward. Prior, 18 months prior to treatment, you could see that what was happening is this individual was losing their hearing. At this stage, and this was over a period of 18 months, after the first dose of Avastin, um, 
the hearing quickly improved. And what you can see, it went back essentially up to normal and continued. This is the three-year mark. And one thing that's important that we don't usually give a lot of talks on some of the details because we don't have time. It was very interesting to learn that when she had a normal upper respiratory infection, a cold, a cough, she would lose hearing. And when we first saw this, we were worried that individuals, if they got sick, they would the Avastin would no longer work. But what we learned instead was that you treat through this and that people's hearing can return. So medical illness can cause some reduction in the benefit of these medicines, but that doesn't mean it's permanent. This is an individual, when we looked at our initial experience, if we looked at 23 people who were eligible for hearing improvement, about 60% of this group had hearing improvement, about a quarter had stable hearing, about one, uh, one eighth had a hearing decline. So that's tumor, that, that was the hearing. What about tumor size? Here's an example of what somebody looks like who has a, a radiographic response, which means tumor shrinkage to bevacizumab. This is the tumor right here. And you can see over a period of 12 months how there is shrinkage of this tumor. But please note, and I think everyone knows, these tumors do not disappear. I've yet to have a patient whose tumor has 100% disappeared. And I think that's probably because it doesn't. this drug doesn't kill tumor cells. And I'll come back to that important point in one moment. So we saw these nice responses. We didn't see tumor shrinkage. And when we look together at this group of 51 tumors here, what this is is called a, a waterfall plot. So everything above the horizontal line is tumor growth. Everything below the line is tumor shrinkage. This yellow line here represents the threshold we use to declare whether a tumor has shrunk or not. So it has to shrink at least 20%. And when you did, you can see here whether it's the target tumor, the tumor that was actively growing at that time, or the contralateral, which means the opposite side vestibular schwannoma, you could see that about 50% of tumors shrank. And there was not a huge difference between whether it was the fastest growing tumor or the other tumor. I will just point out that in some cases, we see dramatic responses that really can change somebody's life. Um, this is a, a person who's part of a kindred of a family with a long history of NF2, who at the time of presentation here, um, really couldn't walk anymore. Um, she, was that, she had that much vestibular dysfunction and compression of her brainstem. And after about three to six months of bevacizumab, you can see this incredibly wonderful response. I think it's partly related to the cystic nature, this, this dark interior of this tumor. So I don't hold this out to show you that every person has such a good response. Obviously not true. Just to point out that sometimes that happens and it can be very important for certain people. How does Avastin work? Um, just to say that it reduces the leakiness of blood vessels and reverses nerve swelling. There's lots of slides on this and not enough time. I have to be careful not to go over too far for Professor Evans, but this shows you some advanced imaging here, which looks at the permeability or the leakiness of blood vessels inside tumors. And both the Manchester group and the uh, Boston groups have documented that with treatment, you can see decreases in permeability. So that makes sense that the drug is doing what it's designed to do, which is reduce the, the um, shrinkage, uh, to reduce the leakiness. And what's really interesting is that there's a correlation, which is at baseline, when you start treatment, the leakier your blood vessels are, the more likely you are to have tumor shrinkage. And so there is a way to pre-select people who are likely to respond although that's not been paid by insurance traditionally. So it has been hard to operationalize for individual patients. Treatment is well tolerated by most individuals. In our initial group, we had no severe toxicity. We had two patients who experienced delayed wound healing. That means if they had a cut or they had a port removed or something, it took a long time to heal itself. Three patients had protein in the urine. Two patients had high blood pressure. But the very worrisome side effects of blood clots and hemorrhages we did not witness in our first group. We followed up this experience with a study uh, among three different hospitals, including Johns Hopkins. This was led by Dr. Jayshree Blakely, 
as well as Brigitte Wiedemann, uh, Dr. Wiedemann's at the NCI, and of course me at Mass General Hospital, saying, okay, well, we did it in some patients in Boston. How generalizable is this? What this shows you is during the initial treatment period of one year, we saw hearing improvement in about 36% of people and tumor shrinkage in 43%. And so we did confirm that this was true using a dose that was now every three weeks rather than every two weeks, an equivalent dose. And when we stopped treatment, what we saw is that some of these benefits were lost. That is, people who initially had hearing improvement started losing hearing, and people who had tumor shrinkage had some tumor growth. And so we do now know that discontinuation of bevacizumab can result in both tumor growth and hearing loss, usually after a period of three, six, or nine months, depending on how sensitive somebody is to the medicine. This was followed. So with that confirmation that in three hospitals that we can do that, we then broaden this to a larger consortium through the Department of Defense. So we launched study NF-104 that had two phases. One was an induction phase. That means for the first six months, we treated at higher dose. And we, the question was, if we increased the dose to cancer levels, could we increase outcomes? And we were looking both at hearing and tumor shrinkage. The second question we sought to answer was, if we followed with maintenance dosing that was very low, could we treat at low doses and thereby reduce harm, reduce side effects, uh, without compromising benefit. Can low-dose therapy preserve hearing and prevent tumor growth? I'll just quickly show you that we didn't, for induction therapy, we didn't see any clear benefit of increasing the dose. For time reasons, I'm going to run through this, but just to show you, we didn't see an improvement in the hearing improvement rate. This is the, this is the higher dose in the middle column. Um, and I'll go quickly to the maintenance when we had low-dose maintenance therapy for 18 months, we did see good preservation of hearing. So we were able to treat at relatively low doses for 18 months without losing hearing. Now, one key thing I wanted to highlight is that in this study, we confirmed what Manchester had been reporting, and that is that children seem to benefit less than adults. And this is a very subtle point, so I want to be really clear. The take home message is not children do not benefit from bevacizumab. I think that, that, that they clearly do, in my opinion, and we've treated a number of people under the age of 21. But I think our expectations have to be a little bit um, more realistic that they may not benefit as well as some of our really top performers who tend to be adults. So here are the conclusions of that study, um, in our opinion, at least my opinion. Um, first of all, that this induction treatment. Um, is associated with hearing improvement, and we're seeing stabilization of these numbers around hearing improvement around 40%, tumor shrinkage in 35%. With maintenance chemotherapy, we can maintain that benefit without a lot of hearing loss. There are some patients who have hearing decline on that low dose, but what's important is if you increase that dose, you can rescue it. So it's not like a permanent loss. So in our experience, it's been worthwhile to minimize the dose during maintenance treatment. And as I mentioned, that pediatric patients seem to benefit less than adult patients. And so we've adopted a strategy where we treat with what I would call induction therapy doses. This is half of the cancer dose. So the standard for bevacizumab in, in, in um in NF2, so that's 7.5 milligrams per kilogram every three weeks or five milligrams per kilogram every two weeks with a lower dose maintenance. Uh, as you can see here, I'll just say that some people get treated once a month. That's another way of doing dose reduction and maintenance and is probably uh, appropriate as well. Just to point out, and uh, Professor Evans will talk about this, when you throw in the real world evidence from the UK, it's very similar to the US experience. So there's a lot of generalizability here. And I'll just highlight the hearing improvement rates and the tumor shrinkage rates are very comparable across the pond in both directions. I'll just throw in this slide now to throw in bevacizumab. Priya, cut me off when you want to, just to say that the likelihood of bevacizumab use, I think, does increase as we go into the late stage. And it's unclear what the benefit is in these very early stages. I would argue uh, not as much benefit. Do I have three more minutes, Priya, or am I cut off? 
Uh, just a couple minutes. Okay. So then I'll just point out the other tumors that affect people who have NF2 can also respond to treatment. This, this is an example of an individual who has an NF2-related spinal ependymoma. And just to remind you, this is the spinal cord on these images. This is the tumor mass, and this is a cyst, which is a fluid-filled compartment. And, what, and this is not tumor. What you can see is it causes mass effect. You can see how expanded the cord is. When we these individuals receive bevacizumab, you can see this nice shrinkage of the cyst. You see that? So the mass effect goes down very consistent with the, with the mechanism I explained of preventing blood vessels from being leaky. So the take home message is we have many patients who can benefit from treatment of uh, ependymomas, but it's not because the tumor is shrinking, it's because the cystic portions, the fluid filled portions are likely shrinking. Finally, for meningiomas, just to say that when we looked at our experience with meningiomas, we saw that a number of the tumors shrank. This is, you can see about 29% of the tumors shrank, but the problem was the duration of shrinkage was short, meaning that for a minority of tumors, you might get a short-term response, but we don't believe that bevacizumab works as well for meningiomas as they do for vestibular schwannomas. So here, here are the overall conclusions. It's our only medical treatment that improves native hearing. I'm trying to exclude cochlear implants and, and ABIs, which have their own role. Um, Long-term treatment is necessary to maintain benefit. Short-term holds are not associated with significant hearing loss or tumor growth in most individuals. Induction therapy can really improve hearing uh, in tumors in about 35 to 45% of people. Maintenance treatment with low dose is a good way to think about long-term benefit. The short-term toxicity is manageable. The long-term toxicity requires very specialized care, but it is also possible. Pediatric patients may benefit less compared to adults. And as I mentioned, we do see benefit across other tumor types as well. And just to finish up with a long list of uh, collaborators and to thank everybody, including all of our patients and families uh, who participate in our research. So sorry to go a little bit over. Thank you. That was very informative. Um, we do have some questions coming in, but I think we'll move over to Professor Evans and we'll do the questions at the end, just in the interest of time. So if Professor Evans, you want to share your slides. Okay, so I'm going to uh, talk a little bit about an audit that was carried out uh, a couple of years ago of our treatments of bevacizumab in, in England. And um, firstly, I would like to say just how much the NF2 community owes to Scott Plotkin, because without his vision and thinking about, you know, uh, treating the first 10 patients without a clinical trial, we would be a long way behind where we are now. It may be that Bevacizumab would have got there, but maybe getting the the big grant for the trial was predicate, predicated on actually having that initial information from those 10 patients. So uh, really it's brought forward NF2 treatment by probably five to 10 years, I would say. And uh, I agree with it. obviously everything he says. I would say that the people who seem to benefit most from hearing uh, improvement are those that have lost quite a lot of hearing recently. So where there's a sudden hearing loss, you can get it back. But where there's very gradual loss of hearing, you don't tend to see the same big upward response in, in hearing. Um, so this is basically just an audit of England. So for those of you that are not in the UK, we have a nationally funded NF2 service to the tune of seven and a half million pounds a year. Uh, that basically means that every NF2 patient is managed by four centres, Oxford, Cambridge, guys in London and Manchester. And we have the biggest 
portion of the population in in northern England. And the whole care of those patients is actually managed by those centres. And this started in 2010. And because of uh, Scott's publication, we were able to get the service to approve Avastin in October 2010. So we have been able to treat people as a national service since 2010, which means we're actually probably way ahead of any other country um, because of the foresight of the commissioners who believed in what Scott had published and the additional unpublished research that Scott let us have, which was the, uh, the next 30 patients. Uh, so the inclusion criteria were anyone that was treated in the year period, uh, and if they, obviously if they weren't NF2 or started after the 31st of the 3rd, then they were excluded. So we had evidence of 214 patients who'd been treated, and uh, one was started after that date. Uh, one had LZTR1 related schwannomatosis, and there was insufficient data on two. So there are 210 patients who met the criteria of having NF2 and having been treated with bevacizumab. So this is the breakdown. Uh, you can see here that it the three centers uh, are really all around the 19, 20% of our known NF2 patients being treated at any one time. And we're all, apart from London, up to closer to 25% of all our patients have at some stage been treated with bevacizumab. And you can see uh, that obviously these figures go up and down a little bit, uh, but uh, as high as 24%, you can 25%, you can see, have been treated before. 160 out of the 210 patients were still receiving treatment as of April, uh, were still receiving treatment at the beginning of the study. So uh, there were 50 new ones. And you can see here the cumulative uh, uptake. That was our first patient in 2010 in Manchester, and then 210 patients by, by uh, 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 the end of the first quarter of 2022. So in terms of treatment indications, we do have a protocol, which means that you have to have a growing vestibular schwannoma or a, another growing schwannoma that is a threat to function. Um, uh, you can see here that the great majority uh, are because of vestibular schwannoma growth. There are a few ependymomas in there, and you, you heard that Scott uh, showed you that Ependymomas do can respond, particularly cystic ependymomas, and it's the cyst that seems to shrink rather than the solid tumour, but that can actually relieve symptoms uh, quite a great deal. And then there were some other target schwannomas. Uh, so in terms of the uh, age, you can see uh, the minimum age is down around 10 years of age um, and the maximum age up into the 60s. Um, and the medians are sort of 20s uh, and upwards. So the patient age at starting of Astin over time, you can see, hasn't really changed substantially. Uh, these are the numbers who have been uh, starting in each year from 2011. You can see it, it's it's pretty much the same with the minimum age uh, around 10 years of age. And as Scott says, we do see slightly less good responses in, in younger patients. I think it's because the tumours are growing more aggressively and faster that the, the BEV is just not able to get on top of them. And, and as he said, increasing the dose doesn't seem to do much uh, about it. So there's the age distribution. You can see here the majority of patients starting in their 20s, but a considerable number in uh, adolescence. And this is the breakdown of the genetic severity. I'm not going to go into big detail, but suffice it to say that the severe type of NF2 is with truncating mutations in the NF2 gene that uh, that seem to cause an effect at, at limiting the function of the protein 
produced by the other side. And you can see here, the majority of patients are in the moderate classic or severe type here, but actually very, uh, a, a very much smaller uh, proportion of patients are in the severe group. So you can see here, pediatric patients, the majority now are being in the severe group because the severe type of NF2 presents at younger ages. So these are the doses. So you can see here that um, actually a lot of patients were pushed onto maintenance dosing, some with as low as 2.5 milligrams per kilogram every four weeks, which is our sort of classic maintenance dose as per, per Scott. Um, so we are able to manage quite a lot of NF2 patients and continue to control schwannomas at, at these lower doses, only having to go in for your infusion every four weeks. But you can see here that there are some patients who ended up on much bigger doses. And there's no doubt that the larger the dose, the more likely you are to run into renal problems. And the problem with renal problems are they're completely asymptomatic until uh, it's too late. So we have to constantly monitor uh, the protein in the urine, the creatinine, and, and check function. And indeed, we've had to take someone, a young person, off uh, bevacizumab today because um, their, their creatinine has gone so high and we're very concerned about their renal function. Having said that, none of our patients have ended up uh, uh, in uh, severe renal function loss. Uh, so in terms of treatment dis discontinuations, uh, only 8% stopped treatment. Um, some were elective stops, so not necessarily because uh, uh, there was a problem, but actually that they decided, let's have a break and see if there is a durable response that the tumours continue to remain stable. Uh, but as Scott said, most of those unfortunately do regrow. Uh, and only a few, uh, only three because of uh, the need for surgery. And the adverse effects mainly are proteinuria and hypertension. Uh, and again, these are asymptomatic. You don't know about them. We, we measure them and we're concerned about them because we don't want people to lose their kidney function. Um, uh, actually, as Scott says, very few patients get any significant symptoms other than tiredness are, are on the day of infusion and, uh, and a bit after that. There are very, very few actual symptoms in, in a young, relatively healthy group of people. So severe adverse reactions in four patients. There was um, one uh, fatigue, neuropathy, arthralgia, myalgia. How much of that was the drug or not is, is unclear. A perforated bowel, almost certainly not related to the uh, uh, the bevacizumab, but again, we can't be certain of that. And this included the COVID period, as you know. Um, so several patients missed treatments because of COVID, but the vast majority of our patients continued to receive their, uh, their infusions, although we did try and push it out to six weeks in some patients, just so that there was uh, less exposure to, to other people. So one of the things that we've looked at is, is could this, and, and this is not necessarily the cleanest study in terms of controlling, but the time to first vestibular schwannoma intervention in patients with NF2 receiving Avastin versus controls. And you can see here that there is a, a much faster route to surgery in those that weren't on Avastin. And uh, not all our patients with growing vestibular schwannomas actually qualify for Avastin treatment. So uh, it, it certainly seems to delay the need for other treatments such as radiotherapy, radiotherapy or, or surgery. And in terms of hearing preservation, again, you can see here uh, that, that functional hearing is preserved for far longer on bevacizumab than in the controls who, who weren't treated. So all of this is suggesting that this is a very, very effective treatment. It doesn't work completely for everyone. And uh, some people will have to stop or have breaks because of, uh, because of side effects. But 
it has been the biggest breakthrough for NF2 without any doubt, um, almost since the diagnosis of the condition. So that's my lot. I, I, I got through that quite quickly uh, because I had to also present on meningioma. Do you want to do the questions on bevacizumab first or do you want to move on to, uh, shall I do my meningioma talk? Priya, you're on mute and we couldn't hear you just now. Sorry, I said if you carry on and we can do the questions at the end just because I'm conscious of time. Okay. Thank you. So this is just a quick one. Um, so there was a, uh, I've been aware for many years that progesterone uh, receptors occur on meningiomas and uh, uh, are a, a potential issue in in their growth and perhaps they're, they're, they're coming to light in the first place. Um, this is why women seem to get more meningiomas than men with NF2 and that they uh, often grow at a more rapid rate than in men. Interestingly, this only is after puberty because boys are actually with NF2 at more risk of meningiomas than girls at the age of puberty. So um, there doesn't appear to be any evidence of estrogen receptors on meningiomas and neither estrogen or progesterone receptors are, are prominent in schwannomas. So there isn't the same gender effect uh, in uh, schwannomas as there are in meningiomas. Um, so the concern has been this recent article because there are certain types of progesterone that it has highlighted may be an issue. Uh, and this is the article that was published just in, in March this year. And they concluded that prolonged use of th these particular progesterones, which I'll talk about, medroxyprogesterone acetate is an important one uh, in, in the UK and potentially in the US, um, are associated with a higher rate of meningioma surgery in the general population. So suggesting that these lead to meningiomas that require surgery. So uh, it is a very large study, but some of the breakdown is not so big. So this is 18,800 women who stayed in hospital for intracranial meningioma surgery in a uh, nearly, well, in a 10-year period in France. Uh, and they excluded some of these uh, because of uh, um, various reasons. So they ended up with 18,000 and they matched them by year of birth and area of residency um, to uh, databases. Um, and they had good drug histories on all of these. And what they found was that certain um, types of progesterone, cyproterone acetate is more re renowned as an anti-androgen, but women can have this in a pill called Diane or Dianet, which is a pill which contains cyproterone acetate to treat acne. So this is the one that seems to be the biggest culprit or concern. And indeed, that has been known before this study. Medroxyprogesterone acetate is the next one, but you can see this is based on very low numbers. But nonetheless, it's a very, you know, it's still highly significant uh, odds ratio of angioma uh, formation. And, and medroxyprogesterone acetate is, isn't used very much in France, but it is used in the UK and in uh, the US as Depo-Provera, uh, a three-monthly progesterone injection, uh, which is uh, a, a form of contraception. And then there are various others that are mentioned there that I will go into in detail. So these are the actual tables. I'm not gonna go into them uh, again in detail, but these are the, the actual odds ratios. Uh, so you can see here, uh, bit, the significant ones uh, between you know, two and five fold here, but the, the biggest effect being the, the cyproteer and acetate. And there seemed also, which fit, fitted with this, an increased effect of longer duration of these treatments. 
So the main concerns, therefore, are the acne products such as Diane and Dianet, which are given to women typically in their teens uh, and early 20s. Um, and so I think people with NF2 needs to be careful about using those products. Uh, the injectable contraceptive Depo-Provera that contains medroxyprogesterone and acetate. So those are the two that, uh, that stand out. And I think we really do need a study in NF2 patients, uh, and I've developed a questionnaire for this, uh, that means that we can actually look at these effects in NF2. They do mention NF2 in the paper, but really they do not have the data to, to properly assess the effects. Um, so in terms of the other treatments, uh, no magestral acetate is sold as Nomac uh, and is a progestin medication used in birth control pills. Chlormodinone acetate uh, called CMA is sold under brand names Bellara, Gynorel and Luteran and Pro Prostal, among others. So these are birth control pills that contain these progesterones. The bottom two are not available in uh, the UK or the USA, which is medrogestone, which is uh, has been used in France, and promogestone, uh, which is the brand name Surgestone, which is only available in France and was actually withdrawn in 2020. So that's the, uh, the the data that we have from this paper. So my my feeling is we need to survey uh, our NF2 patients for uh, progesterone use over a, a, a lifetime. And, but we also can't just say, oh, you've used this and you've got a meningioma. We need to have really good data on how many meningiomas, what size, growth, et cetera. So, this needs to be done in centers that have the data available uh, to, to, to uh, actually crunch the data and see if these concerns are borne out in the NF2 patient population. But certainly, I would advise care over, in particular, um, the acne treatments and, and possibly also the um, Depo-Provera injection, which is commonly used. Brilliant. Thank you. That's very important. So we have a lot of questions to get through, but we'll try and get through the popular ones first. Um, so this is for both Professor Evans and Dr. Plotkin. We'll start with some of the Avastin ones. So one very popular one was uh, um, about Avastin in children. So I know, Dr. Plotkin, you said sometimes it's, well, it's less not as effective in children, but are there any particular concerns or side effects with use of Avastin in children? I would say the opposite, that children tolerate bevacizumab beautifully. Uh, my experience has been that in some ways it's safest to give it in children who, who do really great. So I, I personally don't have any concerns except to say being a younger patient, you know, I tend not to commit people to bevacizumab because you have to, you need long-term treatment. So if you can avoid having somebody on 20, 30 years, that would be great. Um, but if somebody needs it, I don't hesitate because of side effect reasons. Do you, do you Gareth? No, I, I, we don't either. I mean, we, we try not to treat under 10, but, uh, and it's very rare because vestibular schwannomas in NF2 rarely present growing rapidly before puberty. So uh, in fact, the ones that we follow up pre-puberty, and this was published by Martina Ruggieri a few years ago, actually grow very slowly up to the age of 10. There is the occasional one, but the majority that we monitor grow very slowly. So we actually don't have a need to treat under the age of 10 anyway, in terms of growth rates. Okay. And um, you both mentioned about rebound growth when you stop Avastin. So do we know much about what that growth looks like? Does it get quicker after stopping Avastin? And how quickly do we see that growth? Or does that vary from patient to patient? My experience is that it varies. Um, I think sometimes it can be rapid. I think the key to remember is 
the half-life of bevacizumab, that means the time it takes for half the medicine to leave the body, is about 20 days. So after your dose of medicine, you're at 20, 20 days, at three weeks. Let's use three weeks. After three weeks, 50% is left in your body. After six weeks, 25% is in your body. After nine weeks, you're down to 12.5%. And this varies person to person, but you get the idea. So I think there's a lot of variability. Having said that, um, usually it's a, it's a very gradual off process. So it's not like you stop and then in the next minute you see rocket growth. At least that's my, my um, experience. Yeah, so we don't we don't see anything in the first three months because, as, as, as Scott said, that there's still a Vastin around. Um, that the rebounds will never go to the size that tumor would have been originally if if you hadn't treated it. Um, they often bounce back towards the size if they've shrunk. They bounce back towards the size at the start, and some of them can be quite rapid. Um, but interestingly. You know, if we re if we retreat with bevacizumab, then nearly all of them respond again. They may not respond to the extent that they get back to the re reduced size from the first treatment, but they do seem to respond again to the second course of treatment. Okay, so based on that, do you um, regularly recommend treatment breaks, or again, is that very variable? So we have a discussion at the two year point. Uh, so we try and get the dose down. That's the, the big thing, because if you get the dose down to the lower maintenance doses, then the problems with uh, with proteinuria and things are much, much less. Um, but we do have a discussion at the two year point and say, look, it may be worth you having a break and seeing what happens. And there are a few who have had durable responses who stay at the let at you stay completely stable after coming off treatment. So we, we discuss it. Most decide not to because they they have heard from the network that uh, that you know they do tend to regrow. Um, but as you saw, there were six voluntary stops that year. Um, but that's that's what we do. So we we but the main reason for breaks is is proteinuria and uh, and. Uh, and concerns about renal function. We have a slightly different take. Um, I've moved to, uh, after the first six months, I recommend that people use intermittent bevacizumab, three months on, three months off, which means that in a given calendar year, a person would receive six months of treatment and six months of no treatment. That's an equivalent dose. And th there's a reason we moved to that, and we hope to pull together data this, this summer. Having a three-month off period scheduled allows for surgeries that may need to occur in a very safe and controlled way. So if you need an eye surgery, uh, if you need to have some unrelated surgery, uh, knee surgery, that can happen during your off period. That's been incredibly helpful. And particularly for people who have jobs and lives, which we hope everyone maintains while on treatment, three months without treatment or for the whole year, six months no treatment really frees you up in a way that is hard when you're coming to the hospital to get treated on a regular basis. So it's the equivalent dosing, it's just given intermittently rather than by reducing the actual dose. Yeah, I agree. I agree that's an excellent idea. We 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 haven't considered that, so I think that's something we will consider. And, and again, we would, if someone needed surgery, um, that we would stop the treatment and do, uh, they would have to wait uh, uh, about six weeks before we would, the surgeons would be willing to do the surgery. And then they need to wait another, uh, another four weeks, probably two or three weeks after the surgery before we would start again. So, so it exactly. is almost a three months. It's That's almost exactly what we do, Gareth. I mean, you hit it on the head. We wait two months, surgery, and then a month to recover. We're yeah. not quite as organized as the UK system. So this gives us a little bit of predictability on the US side, which can be sometimes challenging. Okay. And um, this one's Dr. Plock, and I know you have to leave. So um, do you have any updates on brigatinib and have you had any experience of combining Avastin with other drugs for NF2? 
I have lots of updates on brigadinib. Unfortunately, I won't be able to share them today. I do hope that we will have a publication out, uh, I hope, within uh, by the time of the international meeting in Brussels. So I would keep your ears open for that. We do have some limited experience with the combination. I'm not recommending that routinely for people because it has not been tested for safety. The main overlapping toxicity is high blood pressure. Um, but obviously that thought has come to our mind and we uh, you know, are in discussions to see if we can make that happen. Whether we can or not, we'll have to see. Okay. Um, I'm just looking through the Q&A for some questions. Um, so some th questions about side effects. I know you've both touched on the side effects, um, but there were some questions regarding fertility specifically, especially for young adults considering Avastin. Yeah, we do discuss we do discuss fertility and we do discuss uh, egg harvesting uh, in in women. Uh, it's more a concern in 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 terms of ovarian reserve function in women. Um, um, and there, there were, you know, uh, the original work, I think there was some concerns about in monkeys, for instance, but there, there does seem to be some evidence of reduced ovarian reserve. And that's why we discuss that and, and, and uh, also refer uh, if, if young women wish to have egg preservation um, so that they can have children later because we wouldn't recommend you absolutely not recommend you got pregnant on on bevacizumab okay um and uh, professor Evans, we have so had a number of women who have got successfully pregnant after after stopping bevacizumab um there's a question regarding menopause. So what about um, treatment in menopause, hormonal therapies? Do we know much about specific to menopause? So none of those treatments are used in, in HRT. So so hormone replacement therapy appears to be safe um, from, from that study anyway. Uh, if you still have your uterus and you need to take uh, a HRT, then um, uh, it's, then you will have to have a progesterone as part of that. Uh, probably the safest thing for you to take is a natural progesterone, um, uh, such as utrogestan and and then the, the the estrogen separately. But that's something you'd need to discuss with your specialist. Okay. But HRT seems to be safe in that study. Okay. Sorry, I have to leave, guys. I'm sorry I have another meeting that I can't miss, but nice to see everybody. Be well, Gareth. Thank you Bye, very much. Thank Take you. Take care. Uh, we'll just go through a few more questions of us, okay? So, um, question coming in, We do we need to follow both induction and maintenance treatment? So that is the usual regime, isn't it? So that is the usual regime, and we will actually continue on induction treatment for as long as the, the tumours shrink. So we don't immediately come back from uh, induction treatment at six months if the tumours are continuing to shrink at that point, because we think we can get further shrinkage up to a year. Uh, but most of the shrinkage does happen in the first three months. Uh, and then once we, we feel we've got all the shrinkage we're going to get, we will start to move to maintenance dosing. Okay. And... Are we using Avastin for um, spinal tumours to shrink spinal tumours at the moment? Yeah, so we have had some fairly dramatic effects in spinal tumours. So probably our most dramatic was someone who had uh, gone into a wheelchair uh, with severe pain, lost bladder and bowel function uh, due to a conglomeration of spinal tumours. And they had a, an amazing response. We call them our Lazarus patient. And uh, within two weeks of treatment, they were up and around, catheter out, pain relief down. And 10 years later, that patient is still um, able to function normally. So this is a patient who was inoperable, who, whose life would have been impossible, who uh, uh, 
bevacizumab has transformed their life. Now, it doesn't do that for everyone. Those spinal responses are less usual, uh, but then we do get the responses in the spinal ependymomas, in, uh, particularly the cystic ones, which can be very good. But I think we've seen four or five really good spinal schwannoma responses uh, with return of uh, return of function, which is important. Brilliant. And a couple of questions regarding, can we use Avastin after um, a, tr a tumor has been surgically treated? So I assume if it's... Um, yes, you can. So so we, we will often restart Avastin for the other side in vestibular schwannoma fairly soon after surgery. So we do we do, do that. We have also used Avastin after radiotherapy, and it seems to be very good at, present, at preventing the post-operative swelling, sorry, post-radiotherapy swelling that you get with tumours, because after radiation treatment, and I wouldn't recommend radiation treatment for, for young people, but after radiation treatment, you, you will often get swelling for up to 18 months. So the tumours actually increase in size before they shrink back down. And of course, some don't shrink, but the majority do respond. Uh, and so we have, in instances there again, hearing has gone off with a, a, a rapidly swelling tumor and the Avastin has preserved the hearing, uh, where it might not have been preserved without taking the, the Avastin treatment after radiotherapy. Okay, and is there any um, use of Avastin to treat NF2 meningiomas? Well, Scott told you that effectively, we don't see any role for it. Uh, there is some shrinkage in a few patients, but not very dramatic, and that doesn't last very long. So we don't think there is really a role uh, for Avastin in meningioma treatment. And that's where brigatinib is an, an important development. Okay. And just a couple last few questions. We have a lot of questions mentioning protein beam radiation. Do you have any experiences with that? Uh, yeah, a little. Um, I, again, I'm not a particular fan. Uh, we have had a few not so good responses with protein, uh, proton beam. Um, uh, personally, I'm not a great fan of, of radiation treatment in NF2. And, and there is... There is a malignancy risk, a malignant induction risk, which we published uh, based on 175 uh, NF2 patients that had received radiotherapy compared to about 900 who had not. And the, the increased risk of, of, in, of, a, of, a, of a malignant tumor in the radiation field, either transforming the tumor that you treated or another tumor in the radiation field is a concern, particularly in people under 25. So uh, I think I think it, it's a good treatment as uh, to uh, potentially on the second side and later in life. I'm not keen on it for meningiomas because I think you just create more meningiomas in the radiation field. Um, so I, I, I'm afraid I'm not a radiation fan. Um, but it has its place and it should be discussed uh, because, you know, some people will not want to have surgery. If there is no drug treatment, it may be radiation is their only option. OK, and just a few questions about combination drugs. I know um, Dr. Plotkin didn't get a chance to speak about using brigatinib with Avastin. Do we know much about that yet? So we don't know anything about that. So I don't think there is any human um, work giving both drugs together. I'm not aware of any. Um, as he said, there is a bit of concern that hypertension is a side effect of both. So uh, the concern would be that, you know, it might make it somewhat worse with hypertension. But it, it's one of those things that we need to investigate because brigatinib alongside of Astin might actually work synergistically so that you get uh, an effect in both meningiomas and schwannomas and ependymomas. And uh, it's certainly something we should explore 
in in patients, probably in some sort of a trial, so that we we can actually uh, monitor and publish the results of that, so that pe other people can learn. Okay, thank you. And we've had some questions regarding centers available in places like Canada and India. Um, I think that's difficult for us to comment on, isn't it? I, I think that's a bit difficult to comment on. I, 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 I'm I not really aware of uh, any particular centre in India that I can recommend. Um, in, in Canada, Toronto is probably the biggest centre that has uh, a, a large expertise. Um, I mean, the, the issue is we have four centres in a country of 55 million. That means that Canada should only have two centres. Yeah. So probably you, you would, you know, you'd say Toronto and Vancouver or, uh, but then then the east side of Canada isn't getting, uh, you know, where most of the population is, isn't getting things. But um, in order to concentrate the, the expertise for NF2, you really need to be, covering a population of around 15 million people and of course canada i think is only around 30 million yeah okay um i think we will have to start to wrap up now but we do have other webinars on things like radiation on the website some more information on those specific treatments um we'd like should to I, should i watch it <laughs> <laughs> more for us if you would like, you can also watch it. Um, but thank you very much, Professor Evans. It's been really, really great. Um, no problem. We have the recording, which will go on the website. And we do have a poll for all our viewers at the end of this webinar. If you could please just um, rate what you think. And if you have any suggestions for future webinars, that would be brilliant as well. If I could just also, I didn't get time to thank Oxford, who, who were... Uh, who collated the information for the audit. So uh, the Oxford team, Alison Parry and Dorothy Halliday, need to be thanked for that. Brilliant. OK, thank you so much. OK, cheers now. Bye, everyone. Good evening or good afternoon. <laughs>